But uh, we're going to continue in our Bible study today. If you take your Bibles and turn to the book of Job, chapter 16. We've been studying the book of Job for several weeks now and making our way through the book of Job. Very interesting book. Um, very dramatic story about a man whose faith in God was tested. And Job, you, you often heard the, the term, the patience of Job. And uh, Brother Matt, would you turn those fans off? It is a little bit too cool for the fans yet. We'll turn it on just before church time. Thank you. Um, you've often heard that term, the patience of Job. Well, when you see all that Job went through, you can understand why Job has been attributed to that, that term patience, because Job surely was a patient man. He was patient with his friends, although he gets frustrated at them from time to time. He gets a little frustrated with, with his situation, and, and, but he never does turn his faith against God. He never does uh, curse God. Just to bring you very briefly up to where we are here in chapter 16, the book of Job starts out where Satan and God were talking one day in heaven, and Satan does have access to heaven. He's called the accuser of the brethren, and he was up in heaven one day talking to God, and God says, hey, Satan, he said, what do you think about my servant Job? He's an upright man. He loves me. He, 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 he stays away from evil. He's a good guy. And Satan says, yeah, well, you, 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 that's because you bless him. You, you've blessed him. He's got all kinds of cattle and, and 10 children, and he's got all this wealth. And, and the only reason Job loves you is because you bless him. He said, if, if you take away all his stuff from him, he won't love you anymore. And God says, okay. He says, let's, let's, I'm up for the challenge. He says, go ahead and do that. And so we, we read in chapter 1, uh, in verse 13, where, where, where the, his daughter, sons and daughters were in their eldest brother's house, and the wind comes over and knocks the house down and kills them. A messenger comes, and verse 14 tells him his oxen were plowing, and the asses were beside them, and the enemies came and took them away. And verse 16 says, while he was speaking, another one came, said, the fire has fallen from heaven, burned up the sheep and the servants, and I'm only come to tell you. And while he was yet, another one came and said, the Chaldeans made the bonds and fell on the camels and carried them away. So here he's lost his children. His his camel, his sheep, his oxen, and everything was taken away from him. And the Bible says at the end of chapter 1 that Job did not uh, sin. It says, in all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. So Job passed the test. Satan challenged God that if you, you take away all his stuff, he, he, the only reason he loves you is because you give him all this stuff. Well, Job lost all of his stuff, and all his children, 10 children, and yet he did not charge God foolishly. So Satan and God were talking again, and he says, well, now what do you think of my servant Job? And Satan says, yeah, well, you know what? If we touch his, uh, you know, a man, skin for skin, um, if you touch a man's body personally, then he'll turn his back on you and he'll curse you. And God says, okay, I'll allow you to do whatever you want to do to him, but don't kill him. And, and Satan comes down to Job, and he is struck from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet with running sores all over his body, similar to, to leprosy or elephantiasis. And, and, and all, here's Job. He's, he was the one of the most prominent men in the, in the city, and now he's sitting at the ash heap at the end of the city, in the, in the city dump, in the ashes, trying to get relief from his, from his sores. And he's taking a broken piece of potter, and he's scraping the, the sores on his body, trying to, trying to get some relief. But yet he still does not curse God and die. Sitting in the ash heap, three of his friends hear about Job's dilemma, and three of his quote-unquote friends come by to try to console him. And they meet Job there in that ash heap at the edge of the city, and they sit there for seven days and seven nights, and nobody says a word. Finally, Job starts talking and explaining to the fellows, you know, he doesn't understand what's going on. He doesn't understand why this has happened to him. Uh, you know, that as far as he can tell, he has not sinned against God to, to deserve this kind of a punishment. So then his three friends start giving their opinion as to what's wrong with Job and what happened to Job. And so the first friend, his name was Eliphaz, come and said, you know what, Job? The reason all this bad stuff happened to you is because you have sinned. You've really done something wrong against God, and God is punishing for that sin. Job knows he didn't sin. He's, he's, he's trying to think through his mind, what could he have possibly done? The Bible says in chapter 1 he was, a, he was an upright man. He, he feared God and eschewed evil. He, didn't, you know, he stayed away from evil, and he loved God. So Job's first friend says to him, he says, why don't you just ask God to forgive you for your sin, and then he'll restore all your stuff back to you. Well, thankfully, Job didn't listen to that first friend because if Job had confessed a sin to God, 
That wouldn't have been true because he didn't know of the sin that he had committed that would cause this. Job was being put under a test. As I said before, when we studied the book of Job, Job was a, was a prime example of a test to show the world and to show Satan that a man will love God no matter what happens to his life. And that's where faith comes in. So the first fellow says, Job, you must have sinned. You just need to confess your sin and God will restore all your stuff to you. Well, that would have been, the, if, if Job had done that, he would have fallen right into Satan's trap. Because remember, Satan said to God, the only reason Job loves you is because you're good to him and you give him all this stuff. So if Job had come to God in a false confession and said, Lord, I don't know what I've done wrong, but please forgive me and restore me, you know, all, and he would have fallen right, and Satan would have said, aha, see, the only reason he loves you is because he wants his stuff back, and now he's coming and confessing his sin to you. So the first fellow said, Job, you have sinned, and that's why God's punishing you. His second friend now speaks up. His name is Bildad, and he says, God's justice proves, Job, that you have done something wrong. God blesses the righteous and God punishes the wicked. And Job, since you're being punished in this terrible way, the justice of God proves that you have done something wrong. Well, we all know that that's not the way God operates. Yes, God does bless the righteous and yes, God will punish the evil. But sometimes bad things, what we call bad things, happen to good people. And God is, has a purpose and a plan for all of that. So his second friend is all wrong. And he says, you know, because of the justice of God, you must have done something wrong. Then Job's third friend named Zophar comes by and he says, Job, you're a hypocrite and a liar. You say that you can't figure out any sin that you've done wrong against God, but look what God is doing to you. God has taken away your 10 children. He's taken away your camels. He's taken away your, your sheep. He's taken away your, your, your donkeys. He's taken away and, and, and your, your, uh, your children were all in their eldest brother's house when the wind came by. He said, God has taken everything away from you. So for you to say that you have not done anything wrong, you're a hypocrite. You know, a hypocrite is somebody who says one thing and does another. So his third friend says that Job's a hypocrite. Job is saying with his mouth, that he cannot think of anything that he's done wrong that would cause God to punish him this way. But yet his friends see the punishment that obviously Job is undergoing. And so his third friend comes and says, yeah, you're a hypocrite. You're a liar. You had to have done something wrong. You just don't want to tell us about it. Well, finally, when we come to chapter 16, Job is up to here with all of the advice that his friends are giving him. And as I said before, when we were studying this lesson, we need to be very, very careful how we judge another person. In fact, the Bible says we're not supposed to judge another person because see, you and I, we're reading this story and we know that Job didn't do anything wrong, but God was putting Job as a shining star. He was shining his spotlight, so to speak, on Job's life, on Job's life and he's telling Satan, look, this is a man who will love me no matter what happens. We know Job didn't do anything wrong, but his three friends are looking at his life and they're saying, Job, you've lost your children. You lost all these. You, 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 you had to do something really, really bad. And you have really angered God to where him, he's going to punish you like this. So all his three friends come up with their theories. We know they're all wrong. This is a lesson to us to be careful. We see somebody going through something in their life. Don't say, oh, boy, so, so and so is really having a tough time. And, you know, maybe it's because of something they did. Or maybe, you know, they're having a tough time financially and God's really punishing them for something they did. Or they have an illness in their family and God's really punishing them because of something they did. So look at the illness that's in their family. That's not, no, that's, first of all, that's not for you or I to try to determine. We're not supposed to look at other people. When we look at other people going through something, we need to pray for them. We need to try to encourage them. And that's what Job's going to say. We're going to read that in just a few more in, in just a few minutes. But here Job's three friends come and they want to give their theories as to why they think Job's going through all this. So finally, Job in chapter 16 has reached the point. He's heard all their theories. He's heard all that they have to say. And look what Job has to say in Job chapter 16 and verse 1. Then Job answered and said, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters, comforters are ye all. Shall vain words have an end, or what emboldeth thee that thou answerest? He goes, fellas, he says, I, you know, I can imagine him saying, I appreciate you coming and being with me. He says, but you guys are miserable comforters. 
You haven't said anything to, to try to comfort me. All you're doing is judging me. And so Job finally, he's, he's, he tells him straight up, he says, you're miserable comforters. So this is Job's plea for sympathy. Look at uh, verse 4. I could also speak as ye do, if your soul were in my stole stead, I could heap up words against you and shake my head at you. Here, his, 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 he was telling his, his friends, he says, look, if I was in your place and you were in my place, I would try to comfort you. You know, there's an old American Indian proverb that says, that, uh, never criticize a man until you've walked one mile in his moccasins. You see, these friends, they're just looking at Job and his situation and they're coming up with their own analysis as to what's going on. Instead of putting themselves in Job's position. What they needed to do is stop and say, well, what if Job is right? What if he hasn't sinned? What if he hasn't done something that would incur the wrath of God like it has? Well, then they would be just as confused and, 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 and as, as befuddled as Job is. But instead, they come up with their theories as to what's going on. And Job said, you guys are miserable comforters. If, if you were in my place and I was in your place, I would bring you. That's, what he, that's exactly what he says here in verse 4. If your soul were in my soul stead, in other words, if we swap places, I could heap up words against you. In other words, I could do what you guys are doing to me. I could come up with all kinds of accusations and all kinds of theories as to why I think you had. I could heap up words against you and shake my head at you. In other words... Man, poor Job. You know, you know, people do that. They shake their head. Man, well, well, have you heard about Job? Man, he's really going through it. He's sitting in the ash heap and he lost all his children. He says, I could have done that to you if you were in my position, if we had swapped places. But then look at verse 5. But I would strengthen you with my mouth, and the moving of my lips should assuage your grief. That word assuage means to be relieved. He said, Job said, you know what? If you were in this situation where you're struggling and trying to figure out why all this bad stuff happened to you, and I came up to you, I would try to be your friend. I would try to encourage you. I, I wouldn't try to discourage you or, or come up with a theory as to why, because the truth of the matter is they don't know why. And it's very obvious they don't know why. And so Job says, you guys are not very good friends to me. You're, you're not helping me at all. You're discouraging me. I would help you if you were in the same position. His friends are aging him. Look at, look at verse 6. Though I speak, my grief is not assuaged. And though I forbear, what am I eased? He says, I am not assuaged. Uh, his, his grief is not assuaged. In other words, you guys aren't helping me. You guys aren't relieving me. You guys aren't giving me any kind of, 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 of measure of, of uh, comfort. And he says, I forbear, what am I eased? And forbear means to resist and hold back. In other words, Job is, up to this time, Job is held back saying anything to his friends about, about, you know, really coming down on them for what they've done to him. So he's just been sitting there, suffering, trying to figure out why all this bad stuff's happening to him. Three friends come by and give him all this negative stuff about what they think as to what's going on. And Job just has to sit there and listen to them. And he, and he's finally, he says, you guys haven't relieved me. You haven't helped me. You're miserable comforters. And if you were in my place and I was in your place, I would, I would come over here and try to comfort you. And then, uh, look at verse eight. Thou hast filled me with wrinkles which is a witness against me, and my leanness rising up in me beareth witness to my face. My mother used to tell me that. You see these gray hairs in this head? You put them there. You know, Job is saying, look at, he says, you guys, you guys aren't really helping me. He says, you're putting wrinkles in my face, guys. You're just really wearing me down. You're wearing me out. And, uh, you know, my, like I said, my mom used to say that to me. Of course, I was, I was a, a very good child and never had any problems. But every once in a while, she would just go off the deep edge and say that no. But that's what Job is saying here. He said, you've made me weary. And in verse 7, you've made me desolate of all my company. You filled me with wrinkles, which is a witness against me and my leanness. Rising up in me beareth witness to my face. He says, man, I'm losing weight. I'm, I'm, I'm becoming like a skeleton out here sitting in this ash heap. You know, people who get in, into, into deep uh, depression like this and, or go through some kind of thing, that, you know, they just lose their appetite. They don't, they don't want to eat, and they, and they start getting skinny. And Job says, look, you guys are putting wrinkles in my face, and look, I'm, I'm becoming skinny because of, of and it, the, it bears witness in my face. In other words, his face was becoming probably drawn in and gaunt and all wrinkly. And Job says, this is all you guys have done for me. You, you've just increased.
increased my suffering. You've increased my misery by coming here and telling me how you think what's, what's wrong with my life. And then he says in verse 9, he's talking about Job is worn out. His family is gone. His, he's very tired. He's very weak. He's got these sores on his body from the top of his head down to the bottom of his feet. And, and, and God is, is attacking him in this way. And he's trying to figure out why. And now his friends are attacking him. And, and he's, he just, he just to the end of his rope. Look at verse nine. Speaking of God, he said, he teareth me in his wrath who hateth me. He gnasheth upon me with his teeth. Mine enemy sharpens his eyes upon me. They have gaped upon me with their mouth. They have smitten me upon the cheek reproachfully. They have gathered themselves together against me. I mean, if, if, if that's what a friend, you know, like the old saying, well, with friends like that, who needs enemies? I mean, Job's friends weren't being friends to him. They weren't, they weren't really helping him out in any way. And, and Job feels like that he's got a target on his back. He feels like God, for some reason, has pointed all of these bad things in his life. And all of these negative things are happening to him in his life. And he feels, in fact, that look at verse 11. He says, God hath delivered me to the ungodly and turned me over into the hands of the wicked. He feels like God has just removed his hands off of Job's life. He feels like God just, just, you know, just let, let every, all the wickedness come upon him and God is not stopping it and God is allowing it to happen in his life. Verse 12 says, I was at ease, but he hath broken me asunder. He also hath taken me by the neck and shaken me to pieces and set me, set me up for his mark. Job says, I feel like I got a target on my back and everybody's shooting arrows at me. He said, I feel, he says, I feel like God has, has delivered me over to the ungodly and he's broken me down and he's like, a, like, a, like, a, you ever, you ever watch these uh, National Geographic shows or something like that where they show these animals in the wild and you see the predator, he's chasing that, that animal trying to get him and he finally gets him and he just grabs him by the neck and he rings him back and forth. And that's what Job said. That's what I feel like. He said, I, I, I feel like a rag doll in, in the mouth of God and, and, and he's just ringing me back and forth and I'm going through all this stuff and I'm trying to figure out what's going on and you guys aren't helping me at all. And I just feel like God painted a target on my back and not only is God punishing me for what reason I haven't figured out yet, but you guys come over here and instead of encouraging me, he says, you, you have just made wrinkles on my face and made me lean and made me uh, just, just discouraged. And, and if yeah, I was in your place and you were in mine, I would encourage you. So Job's really uh, getting down to the end of his rope. He feel like that, that everybody's shooting at him. And if Job looked up, God was against him. And if Job looked around, his friends were against him. In fact, his, his, his wife even told him, we, we studied that earlier, she said, Job, she, she saw her husband Job going through all this suffering. She said, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? And as I said before, don't get too hard on Mrs. Job. She wasn't, uh, you know, I believe Mrs. Job was saying, Job, you're suffering so bad. You know, why, why don't you just get, get, get over with and let God just go ahead and take you on to heaven. You're suffering so much. You know, I don't, I don't think she was necessarily wanting Job to turn his back on God, but she just, she just couldn't stand to watch her husband going through all this stuff. Then Job gives a plea for justice. Look at verse 15. Or no, I'm sorry, verse 13. His archers compass me round about. He cleaveth my reins asunder. He doth not spare. He poureth out my gall upon the ground. There again, he, in verse, at the end of uh, verse 12, he says, he set me up for a mark. And in verse 13, he says, his archers compass me round about. There again, the thought of, of he feels like he's got a target painted all over him and, and people are just shooting arrows at him and, and trying to knock him down. And then in verse 14, he says, he breaketh me with breach upon breach. He runneth up upon me like a giant. He said, you know, just one thing after another. When, when all those bad things happened to him, they just came one after another. One servant comes in and said, you know, the, your, your camels and, and all are gone. And then by the time he's not even done speaking, another one comes in and says, you know, the, the, the enemies came down and took all your sheep. And by the time he's, another one comes in and says, all your sons and daughters were at your eldest brother's house and a wind came and blew the house down. I mean, just one after another. And that's what he's saying there. Uh, breach upon breach runneth upon me like a giant. He feels like that God is like this big giant. And he's this tiny little ant. And if God wanted to, he could just crush him. And I'm sure at times Job wishes it just would go ahead and happen and be over with it because 
Not only is he suffering physically, but he's suffering mentally. He's going through this mental gymnastics thing of trying to figure out why all this stuff is going wrong. So Job is really tough. He's going through this difficult time, and we, as we said, the patience of Job we see in that he's going through this difficult time, and even though he's totally frustrated at his three friends, and even though he's totally at a loss as to why God is doing this, he still retains his faith and his integrity and his love for God. Oh, he's human. There are times when, and we read in the earlier chapters, when Job wishes he had been dead when he was born. He wishes he had died in the womb, or he wishes that once he was born that, that he could have died instantly right there rather than go through all this. So Job is human. I mean, that's, that's one thing about that when we read the Bible characters that God has placed in these stories in the Bible. Uh, they're not these superheroes that have this, this you know, uh, a chest of iron and, and wills and determination. And all. They're human. They get discouraged. They, they, you know, King David got discouraged. Uh, great, great men in the past, in the Bible, have got to, King Saul got discouraged. Uh, we, we talk about all these different men of the Bible. Well, Job got discouraged at times. But keep in mind, he never, ever lost his faith in God. Came pretty close a couple of times, but he never did lose his faith in God. Now, Job's dilemma is he knows he's right with God. Look at verse 16. My face, or I'm sorry, verse 15. I have sewed sackcloth upon my skin and defiled my horn in the dust. Now, back in the Bible days, people wore sackcloth when they were mourning if a death of a loved one or something like that, they would put on sackcloth, which is basically goat's, uh, goat skin, which is uh, go the goats in, in the Bible days were black. They used them for tent coverings and they used them when they were mourning. And Job says, I've been going through so much suffering. Get, get, the, get the picture that he's giving us here. He's going through so much suffering that he not only has just put on the sackcloth, uh, when, when they're, like I said, when people are mourning the death of someone, they would put sackcloth on, and that would be an indication to everybody that they're in mourning. But it was just a temporary thing. They would just put it on sort of like a shawl over their garment, and that would be an indication to everybody that something's gone wrong, and they're, and they're sorrowful about something that happened in their life. But Job says, I've got so much going wrong with me. He says, I just sewed sackcloth on me. In other words, I'm just permanently in sackcloth. I'm permanently trying to figure this thing out. And then he says, uh, uh, I sewed sackcloth upon my skin and defiled my horn in the dust. Now that, that, that defiled that horn in the dust, the cattle, when, 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 when the cattle would get very frustrated, uh, in studying for the Bible customs class that I'm teaching, I, I came across this, and then when I read this in the book of Job, it, it, it clicked with my little brain, and I said, oh yeah, that, that, that goes along with our study in the book of Job. When, when, when a cattle was, was, was very distraught and very uh, nervous and very edgy, he would take his, his horns and he would just go down on the ground and, and just create this big cloud of dust all around him in frustration. And Job said that. He said, I've sold sackcloth upon my skin. In other words, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly in sorrow trying to figure out what's wrong with my life. And not only have I sowed sackcloth on my skin, I defiled my horn in the dust. He says, I'm like that cattle. I'm, I'm just frustrated and I don't know what to do. And like the cattle takes their horns and stirs up all the dust and just, just, because they just don't know what to do. He said, that's, that's the position I'm in. I'm just totally at a loss as to what's going on in my life. And then verse 17, but look at this. This, every once in a while, what I, here's, in, in the book of Job, when we're studying all this, every once in a while, there's this little glimmer of hope that comes across. There's this little shining light that shows us that deep, deep, deep inside of Job, he knows that he has not done anything wrong. He's just trying to figure this all out. And that's what happens in verse, look in verse 17. Or let's read verse 16 in conjunction with it. Let's go back up to verse 16. My face is foul with weeping. My eyelids is the shadow of death. Not for any injustice in my hands. Also my prayer is pure. Job says, I'm crying, I'm in sackcloth, I've defiled my horn in the dust, I'm frustrated, I don't know what to do, but not for any injustice in my hands. In other words, Job is saying, I know I haven't done anything wrong that would cause God to give me this kind of a punishment. I know, K-N-O-W, I know deep in my heart 
that there's nothing that I would have done that would cause this injustice. But, he says, um, my record is, I'm sorry, not for any injustice in my hand. Also, my prayer is pure. He said, all I'm asking God is to please tell me why this is going on in my life. Please end this suffering and this torture that I'm going through. Please get me out of this ash heap and, and you know, I mean, just help, God, help me to get to the end of this part of my life. And then verse 18, he says, O earth, cover not thou my blood and let my cry have no place. Now, the ancient people believed that the blood of the innocents cried out to God for justice and they were restless for justice. Hold your place in Job and turn to Genesis chapter 4. Here's an example of what we're talking about here when he says, my blood crieth out. In Genesis chapter 4, we have the story of the first murder in, 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 in the Bible, in the history. In Genesis chapter 4, in verse 8, it says, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And in verse 10, And God said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. So the ancients believed that the blood of an innocent person would would cry out from the ground trying to get vengeance and justice done. And here Job says that, O earth, cover not thou my blood, and let my cry have no place. What it is, Job is saying that even if he died, he would be restless until he could find out why God did this to him. Even if he was to pass away and he, and his blood be spilt upon the ground, that he, his blood would be restless and his blood would be crying out. Just like God said to, to Abel about, about his brother, said to Cain about his brother. He said, your brother's blood crieth to me from the ground. What's that, what's that cry all about? That's that cry of why did this happen? You know, I mean, Cain, Cain uh, was killed his brother Abel. Abel did nothing but bring the proper sacrifice to God. And so here Job is, is picking back up from that same type of, of mentality that these ancient people had in, in the fact when he said uh, that, uh, O earth, let not the cover my blood, nor let me have cry my place. But now, behold also, verse 19, my witness is in heaven and my record is on high. Job's repeated his cry all along to his friends, he says, guys, you've come up with these theories that I've sinned, I've done something wrong, and this is why God's punishing me. He says, but I know, but I can't show you guys, but my record is on high. You know what he's saying? He's saying, this might be one of those deals where I'm just going to have to wait until we get to heaven to find out what's going on. My record is on high. Uh, my witness is in heaven, and my record is on high. God knows that what I'm telling you guys is true that I cannot figure out anything in my life that would cause God to do this kind of punishment to me. And my record is on high, my witness is on high, and I guess, fellas, we're just gonna have to wait till we get to heaven for you guys to see that what I'm telling you is true. I'm not a liar, I'm not a hypocrite, I have not done anything wrong that God would have to punish me, but I can't prove this to you because my witness and my record is up in heaven. That's going to be the case of a lot of folks that have something going on in their lives and they don't understand why. Sometimes during our life, we'll be able to look at back on some of the things that happened in our life and we'll go, okay, wow, I see why that happened. But there's some things in our lives where we're not going to have that privilege. And we're just going to have to wait until we get to heaven to have God explain to us why certain things happened in our lives. But then look at verse 19. And also my witnesses in heaven, my records on high, my friends scorn me, but my eye poureth out tears unto God. Oh, that one might plead for a man with God as a man pleadeth for his neighbor. He's back to that old thought of, I wish I could have my day in court. I wish I could have somebody who could go to God and plead my case for me. I wish there was a, some kind of a go-between that, that would be able to go to God and say, God, would you please kind of, you know, help Job out here? He's struggling. He doesn't know why you've done this to him. Would you please help him out? And th th that verse 21 there is that, that plea again for Job crying out for a fair trial. And then in verse 22, he says, Within a few years are come, then I shall go the way whence I shall not return. He says, I know this can't last forever, and I'm, I'm probably going to die with all this going on. And then... Uh, he, he, he gives this, this, this plea. Unto, now he comes for a plea for death. In Job chapter 17, he says, My breath is corrupt. 
My days are extinct and the graves are ready for me. You see, Job has come to the end of his, to the point in his life where he just can't even see into the future. He thinks that his life is going to end, that this is, how, how much worse can it possibly get is what he's saying. He said, the graves are ready for me. And I'm in verse 22 in that, that chapter before he says, I, I go the way I shall not return. And verse one of chapter 17, the graves are ready for me. And, and when people suffer like that, their spirit is broken and they lose hope. When people go through deep, deep suffering like that, you just, you just not, there's no telling what, what kind of things go on in their lives and what goes on in their mind. That happened to my father. My father had colon cancer and he had surgery and he lived very good for seven years after the surgery, but then the cancer came back with a vengeance and the cancer was in his colon, but it had traveled into his spine. He could not walk. He could not sit down. The only thing he could do is lay down in his bed. If he wanted to move around the house, he crawled on his hands and knees like a little baby in order to move because he couldn't stand up and he, and he couldn't walk. And one day, my mother worked at a little drugstore just a couple blocks from our house. And uh, my dad was retired from the United States Steel Corporation. He worked there 40 years. And uh, I went off to college one day. I was living at home at that time. And my mother went off to work at the drugstore where she, where she worked, a couple blocks away. I came home from college about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and then I would go to bed because I worked, at that time, I worked at United Parcel Service in downtown Chicago unloading trucks. And uh, so I would come home from college, study a little bit, and go to bed, and I'd wake up at 9 o'clock at night, and I'd have to go work all night in Chicago. So I came home from college, and I went to bed. And about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, my mother came to wake me up. She said, Jerry, she says, Dad's been sleeping all day. Now, normally he could not sleep more than maybe an hour at a time because the pain would wake him up and he would take another pain pill and then that would help him to rest. And so um, about four o'clock in the afternoon, she came to me. She says, Dad's been sleeping all afternoon. She says, uh, do you think we should wake him up? I said, well, I'll, I'll go wake him up for you my, if you want. She says, well, no, he had a rough night last night. She said, let's just, let's just leave him alone. I said, okay. So I went back to sleep. And a couple hours later, she woke me up. She says, oh, Jerry, she says, oh, my goodness. She says, I never noticed it till right now. She said, I looked next to his bedside, and he had downed all of his pain medication. All the bottles of his pain medication were empty. So what happened was people get in this kind of situation where they, they just can't take it anymore. And Job is in that point right now. Job says uh, the, uh, in verse 22, he says, I shall go the way I shall not return. My breath is corrupt. My days are extinct and the graves are ready for me. This is what happens when people get into this deep, deep despair. He's got sores all over his body. His friends are not encouraging him. He can't get through to God to get God to answer him as to why he's suffering through this thing. He said he's just getting ready to die. He's just preparing for death. Job wanted to act quickly to vindicate him because he sensed that his death was near. He was hoping that God could vindicate him while he was still alive for him, for his own sake, for his wife's sake, and for his friend's sake. But he knows that he can't continue this way any longer. He's already, he's talked about the wrinkles on his face and the skinniness on his face, and he's become lean and he's sitting in this ash heap. Then look at verse two. Are there not mockers with me, and doth not my eye continue in their provocation? He says, and then I got these guys over here that are supposed to be my friends, and they're mocking at me to make things worse. And then verse 3, he says, Lay down now, put me in a surety with thee. Who is he that will strike hands with me? Here, Job's friends are against him. Here, once again, Job goes back to this idea of wanting to have a trial before God, wanting to have somebody that could come and plead his case for him. And he says here in, in verse th three, lay down now, put me in surety with thee. Who is he that will strike hands with me? That were, in other words, who would co-sign for me? Who would sign up with me to agree with me that I have not done anything wrong and help me bring this case before God? And he said, I can't find anybody. You guys keep telling me I've done something wrong. I can't find anybody who's on my side who trusts me when I say that I cannot figure out anything in my mind that I have done wrong against God to deserve this kind of punishment, and I can't find a single one of you guys who would co-sign with me, so to speak, on that, on that, on that issue. And then, uh, uh, People treated him, look, look at verse 5, uh, he that speaketh flattery to his friends, even the eyes of his children shall fail. He hath made me also a byword of the people, and aforetime was a tabaret. A byword is, is just an oft-used phrase, you know. In other words, people, all, all people are doing is talk about, oh, poor Job, sitting in the edge of the ash heap. 
Poor Job. Look what happened. He lost all his kids. Poor Job had all this stuff going on. And he says, it's, 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 people are talking about it so much, it's just become common. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, we know Job's sitting over at the edge of the city in the ash heap. He said, I've just become a byword to these people. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's just everybody knows about it and everybody's talking about it. Then in verse 7, he said, mine eye also is dim by reason of sorrow, and all my members are as a shadow. Upright men shall be astonished at this, and the innocent shall stir up himself against the hypocrite. He says, people are going to start thinking that I'm a hypocrite. People are going to, they see all this stuff I'm going through. My lips are telling them that I have not done anything wrong, but they see all this stuff that I'm going through. And he says, I'm getting, I'm getting labeled as a hypocrite, just like his third friend told him. Then look at, uh, Verse 9, the righteous shall also hold on his way, and he that hath clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. But as for you all, do ye return and come now, for I cannot find as one wise man among you. He said to three friends, he said, now one of you guys can figure this thing out. All you have is your theories as to what's happening to me. He said, but none of you guys have figured this thing out. Not that, not that Job knew what it was, but they, they didn't help him figure it out. And then verse 10, he says, but as for you, or I'm sorry, verse 11, my days are past, my purposes are broken off, even the thoughts of my heart. He said, I've reached the point where I, I can't even think anymore going through all this stuff. And in verse 12 says, they change the night in today, the light is short because of darkness. If I wait, the grave is my house. I have made my bed in the darkness. I have said to corruption, thou art my father. To the worm, thou art my mother and my sister. And where now is my hope? As for my hope, who shall see it? They shall go down to the bars of the pit when I rest together in the dust. So Job is physically wore out. His friends were no help. All his plans are shattered. He can't even think into the future and, th and think what can possibly happen to him. But Job never considered one thing about this. And as we read it, as, as deep and as dark and, and, and dreary as Job went through, he never one time considered taking his own life. You know why? Because God did not answer Job's request for him to death because he had plans for him. See, you and I know that Job was a guinea pig, so to speak. God was going to use Job to show Satan in the world that a man would love God no matter what happens to him. So God is not going to kill Job because there's, there's coming, and as those of you who have read the story, you understand what's going on, but there's coming a day when Job is finally going to get vindicated. But here is where Job reaches the bottom of his emotions. He's reached the end of listening to his friends and all the stuff that they have to say. He can't find anybody who will be his advocate to plead his case before God. And he says, okay, I'm just ready to die. The canker worm is going to take over my body. He says, the grave is mine. He says, uh, the corruption, I call corruption my father and the worm my mother. In other words, my body's going to go into dust, into the ground and into the grave. I've reached the end of what I can possibly do. But hold on, Job has still not cursed God. Job has still not lost his faith in God. And Job has never one time thought about ending his own life. He wants to be vindicated by God before he goes into the grave and onto heaven. And he wants to be able to show him, himself in his own mind and also to his friends and his wife why God did this to him. And when he does find out, what a joyous thing that is to, for Job to realize that he was put under the pressure test of God. He was put under the maximum amount of pressure. When the General Electric Corporation made the very first man-made diamond in 1955, the way they did it was they took a lump of coal and carbon and they put it under 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit heat and one million pounds of pressure and they squeezed and they squeezed and they turned the were they trying to destroy that piece of carbon no they were trying to make it into a diamond and job's life is being squeezed and put under pressure and the heat is being turned up upon his life and just like those scientists at the general electric corporation who made that very first diamond the heat my mom used to when i used to go through difficult time in my life my mom used to tell me, heat and pressure make a diamond. Heat and pressure make a diamond. Now, I know you're going through a hard time, but heat and pressure make a diamond. I don't want to hear heat and pressure take, you know, but, but that's what's going on in Job's life. God is turning the heat up probably higher than he ever has turned on any one person, and he's putting the pressure on Job's life. 
life not to destroy him, but so that he can create a beautiful shining diamond that he could hold up and show to the entire world. Here is a man who truly loves God no matter what happened in his life. And that's what we're going to continue as we continue through the book of Job to see Job, this beautiful diamond that God is creating, a beautiful diamond in the rough, so to speak.